Thessalonica was awesome. Thessalonica bothers me because it's like so short and so good. Uh, but uh, the, if, if we can figure out what Tyrannus is and how to do it, we should, because I mean, he saturated a very large area very quickly and equipped a lot of leaders who were apostolizing. So he was staying in one place and sending equipping and sending leaders out like a machine, like a freaking factory. So um, if we can figure out how to do that, I would do that for sure. That sounds way more fun than getting chased and beaten from city to city. Mm. You know, one, yeah, I, I've, I struggle because I, I'm taking more of an Ephesus approach by staying at Benning, but I do, I'm traveling probably on average once a month. And I'm just trying to figure out, do I need to try to call more men into full-time ministry and travel more? But i getting a sense that uh, one of the things about Ephesus was it was a, um, a high-traffic town. <clears throat> and so is Fort Benning. And I think – and sometimes if the – you can go House of Peace searching or I can go to the PX and they'll just come through. They'll come to me. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think that there's uh, ways – the PS is a post exchange, it's like a, a little shopping mall. So they, I think they both are legitimate. I guess I just seem to kind of realize at least what I'm doing right now is a little more Ephesus. Mm-hmm. And, and Aquila and Priscilla are going to Rome. And, mm-hmm. and Ephesus is going to Colossae. And Chuck, you want to respond to that? You, yeah, I think that's right. I think it's a both and uh, approach. What I what i react to is the author that we all know that says paul made a mistake by moving too early i do not think so you'd have to say well jesus made a mistake you know and the max time he spent with the 12 was three years and that's a drop of the bucket compared to what most people want to do with leadership development. So I, I kind of react to that idea, but. Are you talking about Viola? Yeah. I don't, I don't remember him saying that, at least in the Forgotten Ways book, or not Forgotten Ways, whatever it is, the Untold Story. I, uh, I have deduced that, that I think that that might have been a little early. Mm-hmm. Um, but maybe not. I think one of the things that just challenges me on is to just trust how quickly Paul's ready to empower other leaders yeah. um, mm-hmm. to go do this. And, and whether he was starting the church and then moving on, that's one way to empower. And the other one is he's clearly sending Aquila and Priscilla to Rome and Epaphras to Colossae. That's another way to empower mm-hmm. them. And all of Asia heard the word of the Lord somehow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Probably wasn't Paul himself telling them. Somebody else is telling them. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and the, I have a, oh, go ahead, Jonathan. I was going to say the flip side of the Ephesus thing is Thessalonica, super short amount of time, super awesome church. Uh, and Paul, when he running, writes the epistle, writes about uh, how much the Holy Spirit worked and how much confirmation there was that the Holy Spirit was working in their lives. Uh, and then also he talks about how what deep love they have for one another after a few weeks. I mean, uh, and so uh, strategically, Thessalonica doesn't make any sense to me. And we talk about strategy all the time, and that's what we're we're discussing here. And it just seems clearly like a God thing. Uh, and you know, I'd ha- I'd have that for sure too. Give me that one. I almost think it's a better case study than Ephesus or Rome or. or whatever else doesn't show up in Thessalonica doesn't get uh, show up in the book of revelation with uh, a you've left, left your first love uh, word yeah another thing that Paul is doing here in his case study I mean he really front loads the training on persecution it's like welcome to Christ persecution next lesson his lesson too would probably be you'd probably be repent and believe baptism persecution Mm-hmm. Um, I think in the letter to the Thessalonians, he says, "You know, we, you know, you get, 
you guys, we've told you you were going to be persecuted. Mm. And they are persecuted and they thrive in the midst of it. And I think that that's another thing that challenges me. Like, do I have that front load enough in my own curriculum? You know, some of that's probably because of the reality of the situation. I mean, you know, for example, if you were sharing in, in, a, uh, in a closed country where you really did risk getting your head locked off, that would probably be the very first lesson you'd share. That's not the case here in America. I mean, the, the worst that's going to happen to you is somebody's going to yell at you that's, or close the door in your face. Twice. Uh, yeah, twice. I do have a, a related but slightly different question. Um, so, we, you know, especially in the book of Acts, but especially there, we see Paul uh, listening to the Holy Spirit and responding. And so we've talked about how he, he lingers in some places and he, he moves on in other places. And, and we've speculated, well, uh, that, that he's always driven by the Holy Spirit. Clearly, there's a couple of times where he makes it crystal clear the Holy Spirit said no or yes or whatever. But uh, so I guess my my question is, you know, we, we often come up with strategies and we set goals and everything else. We're going to do this. Should we figure out a way to, you know, minute by minute, listen to the Holy Spirit and respond to the Holy Spirit and, and even if we've set a goal to go to one place and then we, we get up in the morning, we're doing a quiet time, God says, you know, I know your goal was to go share over here today, but I want you to go over here. How do we respond to the Holy Spirit and do that instead of trying to fulfill our, you know, the goal that we set at church last week? Chuck. It sounds like uh, that's exactly what we should be doing. Um, do you think that Paul had a dream or a vision or a prophet come to him and, you know, point out every single place that they needed to go? It seems like I always the made the assumption that he was taking a step forward, and then as he was moving forward, he would hear a voice and it's not audible, you know, just like that passage that says you'll hear turn right or turn left. And Yeah, it's easier to steer a moving ship than one that's dead in the water. So the first command is go. Uh, the first command also is listen to what God is saying. So if you set plans and there's two ditches in this thing, I think. One is you wait for the Holy Spirit to tell you every single step of the way and not obey the command to go. And the other is you're just going and not listening. So there's two ditches that you could fall into. I think they're in tension, but if, uh, you know, if we had to identify the weakness in our life, in my life, I would say I'm more about going without instruction than uh, waiting on how to say something. Um, so everybody has to measure that in their life and then work on their weakness. But, so that's what I would say to that. Others? Comments. Yeah, as you said, I think that you, we, that's why we thump abiding in Christ so much mm. because that's where they should be listening to the Holy mm. Spirit. Um, I, I do think it's important to make a distinction between I set a goal and God spoke to me and told me to do this. Mm. Um, because I think. And I, I try to encourage people not to set goals. I try to ask them, based on everything that we taught and covered today, what do you sense the Holy Spirit is leading you to do in response to this? So that we get what they're hearing from the Spirit. So that it, if they get up and have a quiet time the next day, and they're like, the Holy Spirit's telling me something different, then we really got to talk about that. Um, 
because they're maybe they're struggling to actually hear well. Because I don't think Jesus is confused. It was right today and tomorrow was last. It could be that Jesus said, never mind, you know, or, or maybe you, you really did misunderstand. And that's when the Holy Spirit's going to come in in a more aggressive way and say, no. So I think that that really helps too, because I, I think what people are doing more often, Bud, is they hear from the Holy Spirit and in the moments where we're training them, and then they get out there to go to do it. And they come back the next week and they say, Oh yeah, that really wasn't what God said or, or yeah, I really, you know, mm. I think at least in our, in our context, that's what's happening more often or people are not even taking seriously that they said, God told me to do this last Sunday and this Sunday they show them like, Hey, well, it wasn't that big a deal. Like that, that's really foundations for church discipline. If they tell you God told me to do this and now I refuse to do it. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's a that's a good uh, point, Jim. I mean, because I know I've done that. You know, I felt the leading, you know, and haven't haven't been diligent to do it because you know, yeah, I didn't take it serious, and nobody held me accountable. Um, I guess I was just thinking too, in answering in Chuck's original question. Um, you know, he Paul obviously has a pattern to go to region, regional cities. And there were probably, you know, there was something strategic about that. And then certainly, uh, even from a communication standpoint, uh, all those areas would have had very unique local dialects. You know, you go to the urban areas, they're going to be more highly educated. And, and the Greek is going to be such that, you know, everybody, you know, the dialect doesn't become as important. And then I just thought of that in context of Cyprus, you know, if that was a reason why he left Cyprus. Now we do see him, you know, doing this specific leading. Obviously he told specifically go to Macedonia. And uh, so I, I think the other one is more based on his pattern and what we see the, and, and then, you know, and maybe from lack of silence that he doesn't say, Hey, I'm just trying to go to all the regional cities here. So that, that's just a couple of some thoughts. Mm -hmm. Let's, uh, let's transition into the facts about uh, what happened here and uh, kick this around. I'm going to give you all my screen. This, this is just cut and paste from the Four Fields Manual. So, so you guys see that? Yep. Okay, so there's the area. Um, 25 to 30 million people. I've heard uh, different ranges on that, which is expected. And uh, so one of the things that probably would be good is to do a little bit more research on the different cultural considerations. But the key is... 25, 30 million people. And then uh, the first movement is Cyprus and Galatia. Um, I think, Jim, you were asking the question, and I think it's a legitimate um, question or concern. Is there a movement in Cyprus? Can we... Uh, point to some scripture and say, okay, there was a movement. Uh, we see conversions, but I'm, I'm not sure we see a CPM. So, uh, but that's the uh, first journey. The second journey goes uh, back to some of the churches. Barnabas and Mark are the ones who go back to Cyprus and then they make their way over to Macedonia and Achaia. Third missionary journey. Uh, I, back. I was wondering, is that, is that what it says in uh, Acts when they split up? Does it actually say Barnabas goes to Cyprus, or do we infer that? from? I think it says that. I'm not 100% sure. I, I'm yeah. sorry to slow you down, but these are the yeah. questions I have in my mind, Chuck. I apologize. 
It does say that I made a note of it this time because that's the first time I uh, that struck me whenever I was redoing this. Mm -hmm. yeah, I just found it. Four, 1539. Yeah. Mark. Yeah. And maybe uh, we can make a case from history that there's a movement in Cyprus. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, third missionary journey all the way back through and uh, the gospel is ringing out all the way up to Illyricum. Um, I don't think Paul personally went there. No evidence of, from scripture other than the fact that he says the gospel is ringing out all the way from Jerusalem to Illyricum. Uh, I think that was by proxy, but not sure. So there's a third missionary journey. And so here's the six movements. Um, questions, comments about, you know, saturating a region, 25, 30 million in 15 years with the gospel. Now, each of these is supposed to be a movement. So there's supposed to be six streams of fourth in every single one of these areas? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, it depends on who you talk to. Uh, these might be the six streams of a movement, and depending on who you talk to, a movement is uh, in one geographical area we have six streams to the fourth generation. All those are man-made definitions. I think uh, the way that, uh, let me ask the question, how would uh, Luke describe the movement in the book of Acts? I think for him and Paul, as, as Paul writes even Thessalonians, that the Lord's message rang out from you. Mm -hmm. Not only in Macedonia, okay, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Yeah. Or really, the, it seems like that the mark is everybody's heard the gospel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you're going to use, like, what's their evidence here for that there is a movement um, at Cyprus? You know, it says they traveled through the whole island. Mm -hmm. That's a little weak. I could see number two there, Fergia. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region. Mm -hmm. Okay. But if we're going to say, it depends on you, try to just give your criteria. If we're looking for six strings to fourth generation churches, maybe we don't have any evidence of that. Right. Mm -hmm. In the, in Fergia, in mm -hmm. Galatia. And see, that's my question because I was told that. Six streams of fourth, the reason that that's the benchmark is because we find it in Scripture. But I, the more I do these studies, the more it looks to me like we created that benchmark pragmatically and then read it back into the book of Acts. Uh, because people, whenever I say, I, I've passed that on and people look at me very skeptically, <laughs> and they should. Yeah. Uh, hopefully I didn't say that. Uh I, I see four generations throughout the scripture, and you can make a you can make a case that once it gets the fourth generation, that it's going to keep going. Whether it's sin or the gospel, uh, it's very hard to break that chain. You can make that case, but you can't make a case for defining uh, CPMs. Uh, by four, six streams to the fourth generation. So, so that, that is a pragmatic definition. I think so. I think that's a uh, works of God definition versus a word of God definition. I, I thought that I read somewhere that uh, it's, it's based on secular sociologists just studying how things move. And they basically get to like, hey, if you got this going on, whether it's a strain of bacteria or, you know, a Facebook post, like it's going to, it's mm -hmm. going to saturate after with six strains of the fourth generation. It's hard to kill it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think that's part of the equation. Yeah, it's, it's pra- I think it's pragmatic. I think it's just helpful as a group, of, as a team to go, hey, what do we mean when we say we have a movement here? Mm-hmm. And you have a good definition. Yeah, and I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, having a pragmatic uh, definition just as long as we're not doing what Jonathan, unfortunately, was led into. Hey, this is what the Bible says. Uh, no, not, not six streams to the um, fourth generation. The reason why I brought that question up is because... Um, You know, when when the gospel is spreading like that uh, through whole regions, then there's a, it it looks a little bit different and it's evaluated differently. Uh, Here in America, has the gospel spread throughout the entire region? Um, Some would argue a gospel, maybe not the gospel. (laughs) Uh, But I would say most people know that Jesus died on a cross for their sins and that he's the Lord. They may be saying he's Lord and he's not, but uh, I think most people have heard the kingdom message. So to me... What's interesting, I mean, you, you brought up America, but uh, as we learned uh, the other day, for example, Germany now is an unreached people group. Mm-hmm. And so Martin Luther came from there. So clearly at one point in time, Germany was saturated with the gospel, but now they're considered an unreached people group. So yeah. if we're only a few generations away from, you know, not being saturated. All right. Yeah. So we, you know, we need to wrestle with that. Uh, I think the no place left, pragmatic, agreed on standard for movement is six streams. Not I think, I know, six streams of the fourth generation. I think that's a good goal. Um, But we just have to be careful not to stamp it with biblical. Uh, The other thing I want to point out here is the number of leaders that Paul is developing. Um, That's a pretty solid apostolic team right there. Um, And then all these guys, there's 36 names plus in their how much these guys are leaders, like Lydia, uh, she certainly opened, opened up her home, but that's the last time we hear of Lydia or uh, even in the same town, the Philippian jailer. You know, so how much these guys are developed, we don't know. Some of these folks are mentioned multiple times throughout the scriptures, and we definitely see uh, them leading. So um, it's kind of like us when I look at this list. We hope every single person that we share the gospel with becomes a Timothy. I, I'm not, I think that's optimistic, and that's how I would view this list. But the fact that, that Paul personally knew these people and the way he invested in them, that's a, that's the key leadership takeaway or learning takeaway. And then Interesting that Aquila and Priscilla made the like key list of leaders there and Epaphras made the, the second tier. Mm-hmm. I think I probably mm-hmm. had Epaphras up there in my first tier. Yeah, that would be uh another good study to assess those leaders and their impact. So, Apollos uh, almost seems like he should make the first tier as well. Um, and then you got the timeline here 
uh, and it's the scriptural and historical evidence that this movement took place in a, about a 15 year time span. So that's uh, what, when you all look at this uh, timeline, what does that do for you or not do for you? <laughs> Oh, it does several things for me. It, it makes me believe that uh, we can ask God to go at that same speed. Um, it makes me realize the sense of urgency that the Apostle Paul had and, and the belief that Jesus was coming back any day. And it, I think it, uh, you, you often hear like, well, don't, some version of don't be so intentional you can't speed up the work of God. And, and I would, I guess my response to that typically is if you look at how God works in the book of Acts, probably the question we should be asking is why are we, how are we slowing down the work of God? Mm -hmm. that, we're, that really he's eager to move, I think much quicker than we, than we are. Mm -hmm. um, but he's also very committed to using us and there's not a plan B he would have gone to plan B by now, probably if there was a plan B. Others? I think it moves very quickly. Um, and part of the reason is that pretty much everywhere they went, they led people to Christ within a few weeks, it seems. Mm. And so I think if we were leading people to Christ within a few weeks of reaching a new geography, we would actually be moving this fast. Good. I was talking to a guy yesterday and asking him, uh, are you, uh, you've read Multiply, you've, you've been trained by me, are you or your church seeing multiplication? And he said, no. And I said, what do you think the issue is? And he put his finger right on it. We're not sharing the gospel. I said, That's an accurate assessment. You can't see multiplication until you start to multiply, you know? But even, I think even in our networks that are sharing the gospel that much, uh, we're not seeing uh, genuine believers within the first week or two of showing up somewhere. Um, right. This, this is a problem for us. Yeah, but that's an uncontrollable. You know, that's in the hands of God right there. Unless the gospel that we're sharing is not potent, you know. So. Well, yeah, I, I have more thoughts on that, but that's just something that torments me. Yeah. seems like closely linked to sharing the gospel enough is teaching to obey. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we're not teaching to obey is the sharing of gospel, but also the, the abiding in Christ and those other things, they, those kind of go hand in hand. Yeah. I think the comment that you made about uh, persecution was Paul's third lesson. I think our third lesson needs to be lordship. And our first lesson needs to be lordship. Our second lesson needs to be lordship. And so that's America's need. You know, God is the Santa Claus in America. So the Western, uh, at least these states, I think uh, Australia and Europe are post-Christian. So they're dealing with a different context. But for us, we're, we got pixie dust Christianity, and uh, we need to bring the king. Yeah, I think that's the beauty of the eight or seven, however, the commands of Christ. Every lesson is he's Lord again. Let's see what the Lord says. It's lordship. Yeah. Over and over and over again. Love it. Mm-hmm. And. And Chuck, you were on the previous, one of the previous questions you were talking about, um, you know, is the gospel known throughout, you know, our land and, and you thought it was, you know, and you, and you 
and you mentioned that you you thought that he, and this is just an opinion you thought that um yeah you know, that people knew that he was lord and i don't i'm not so sure about that i don't see that the normal population even you know it ha- thinks of jesus as lord or even has any factual understanding of that hmm. And that the religion of our land is, is kind of a form of uh, theistic deism. It's, mm-hmm. not, it's, yeah. not, it's not the deism of Benjamin Franklin because uh, there's a little bit greater acceptance of the personal nature of, of God, but that, it's not much beyond that. Mm-hmm. It certainly doesn't include, include Christ. Yeah. Lord is like his first name. <laughs> well, the way I think of like my drill sergeant, I mean my drill sergeant is like Lord. If I'm a private in the army, man, that that is that concept of lordship is that's the closest thing they have to it. Yeah, I think we're uh, experiencing uh, Matthew seven twenty one through twenty three. You call me Lord, Lord. And so the when I ask the question, have you received God's forgiveness and made Jesus your boss? I always get yes. The, the issue is not, <laughs> I, I think we think our boss is a sugar daddy, you know, and so they think Jesus is the boss of their life, but he is not. So... Anyways, I wish I were more prophetic at times. Uh, I think that's the need of the hour in our culture. So, all right, we're out of time. Jonathan, would you take us through the final third? Yeah, let's see. What should we uh, practice here? Um, stop the recording and then pick it up again when we get to Q&A.